Welcome to another wonderful episode of Point of View. I'm Pastor Josh Barnes, and on today's Point of View, we have another great spotlight interview. In the spotlight today is David Dusek, who is the creator of Rough Cut Men's Ministry, uh, which is a video ministry, and the author of a brand new book called The Battle, which is about tactics for biblical manhood. And I asked him, I sat down with him, and I asked him about the question, is there anything wrong with masculinity? Here's what he had to say. And I'm joined now by David Dusek, who is an author and uh, part of a lot of ministries related to the importance of men and the roles of men in our society and as and strengthening, really, Christian men. And uh, Mr. David Dusek, thank you so much for joining us here on Point of View today. Oh, man, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. You know, I, I really got excited when I saw your ministry and what you do because we've talked several times here on Point of View, even just recently, about the real, what, what is missing in society of a, a father who teaches their, their children and raises their family. And, you know, a lot of times we talk about how there's so much problems in our society, but that kind of stems from the home. And I, I think a lot of times it really comes from, you know, men not standing up and taking their role. What, what can we do? What, what is, what's going on in society? And can it really be fixed with having men do what they're supposed to be doing? Yeah, I, I think I, absolutely. And w one of the, one of the things that we, we give, I think too much credit to is this, this failure, this abject failure of manhood. And it, in point of fact, it's kind of not our fault in a lot of respects, because if you look back and you go all the way back to, I don't know if you ever watched little house on the prairie, but dad would be out building a split rail fence and mom would ring the dinner triangle and they would all have dinner around the table and and dad was a permanent fixture there then we had uh shortly thereafter an industrial revolution where suddenly dad was working outside of the home and then we had a couple of world wars that followed uh very closely to that and so because of that i think in a lot of cases the biblical leadership the spiritual leadership and just the general leadership in the home uh by default mom became a de facto leader because dad was either at work or at war. And I think that that culture has kind of continued. Now, the statistics are utterly staggering when it comes to fatherlessness in the homes. Uh, marriage has become kind of a second thought too, where we have a lot of folks that are cohabitating, having kids. Uh, and I think that all of those things, when you put them together uh, as a recipe for, for disaster, because truthfully, uh, we are according to the Bible anyway, the spiritual leader of our home, family, community, marketplace, church, and the world. Men are. Uh, and that is just the way that, that God has designed everything that we do. So ultimately, I think as culture has gotten away from biblical truth, uh, more things have become acceptable as we've seen more and more families minus dad. And then on top of that, when pop, pop culture spins dad to be uh, has gone from father knows best to the bumbling buffoon that you see mm -hmm. on TV and, uh, and the likes of Homer Simpson. Then you, and Al Bundy, if you go back to that <laughs> Married with Children show, I think what's happened is uh, dad's been dumbed down to a, a relatively unimportant role in the home. And so therefore we've just kind of abdicated our position as leaders. And I, and I, I think with the inception of terms like toxic masculinity, uh, and the yeah. things that we see coming into the culture, it's just really set the table for a difficult uphill uh, uphill battle uh, for men to resume their position as the leader. And when I say leader, I don't mean lead by domination. I don't mean, hey, it's my, my way or the highway. I mean to lead and love and set the tone in the home for how Jesus loves us and to be, to be the hands, feet, and face of Jesus Christ in our house and say, look, this is the way God loves me and I'm going to love my wife and my children sacrificially uh, and lead them to the foot of the cross in a very loving, non-domineering way. And I think that that's where the confusion comes in, especially with the perception of Christianity, is that we are somehow uh, some patriarchal organization where uh, men lead and women follow and submit. And I can tell you right now that my wife would laugh at the whole concept of submitting because the only reason she would ever submit to a moron like me is because she knows where I get my leadership and that's from the word of God. Mm. And wow. if I got it from anywhere else, 
she would say, you know, dude, I don't think you've got, you know, this is not the right decision to make. And she has carte blanche to second guess me any day of the week because she's smarter than I am anyway. So <laughs> yeah, that's a kind of a nutshell of what, what culture has done, you know, through all of the time uh, dating back to the 1800s and the settlers and coming through everything that, that just kind of happened. Uh, we've just sort of slowly faded off into a, a really unimportance in yeah. a lot of respects. So, I think that's why we get what we get. So it's true that people do look at the term masculinity or masculine, and they do. It is often seen as a negative term these days. You know, yeah. you're you're so masculine. You just you know, um, even even if they're not using it in this in the in the phrase toxic mas masculinity. And so, but that people like that who who think of masculinity as negative would hear you saying that your masculinity is positive, and also that that uh, you're not domineering over your wife and think those are complete opposites. Explain how someone can both be masculine, strong, manly, and also not abusive. Great question. Um, I think masculinity has been disparaged to the point where it is a derogatory term. And I think that there is a strategic combination of masculinity uh, and leading in a way that's loving, in a way that is non-domineering, and uh, as it averts that whole concept of my way or the highway, um, but it comes strictly from following what the way I do it is I follow the Word of God. It says, "In my weaknesses, that's when I'm when I'm strong," and the the only way that I can succeed in this biblical masculinity, not to be confused with the perception culturally of what masculinity is, is to live my life in full surrender and submission to the Lordship of Jesus and allow him to mold me into a different person a little bit better every day. I mean, my goal is to be 1% better than I was yesterday. Um, and hopefully I've lived up to that mission today and I'll do it again tomorrow. Um, I, I think truly that until we, we're, we're, we're fighting an uphill battle, brother. I mean, we're, we're looking at a culture that is hell bent on slaughtering masculinity and Christianity in any way, shape, or form that it can, um, and to do that by putting a spin on a word that really is a solid connotation. Um, I get emails and phone calls from guys who are going to have me come and speak at a live event somewhere uh, that say, you know, we have guys that that don't hunt, that don't shoot, that don't fish, that don't you know, kill their food and cut it open in the front yard and barbecue it on the grill. You know, some of our guys aren't masculine. And that's like, that is not the, the correct terminology. You can be a, a Shakespearean theologian and, and, and be an actor and, and love reading and never touched a gun in your life and still adhere to who God says we're supposed to be as men. Masculine has nothing to do with what the culture says, masculinity has to do with biblical manhood. And that's where we get our wires crossed culturally. Yeah. And when the culture begins to influence the church instead of the other way around, uh, then it's all downhill from there. And that's kind of what we're faced with right now is a, a, a battle against manhood, not masculinity, but the two have become interchangeable terms. Right. And, you know, um, children, I think, need, you know, that influence that that manly influence um i think that's that's apparent and we see in our society today the results of of that father figure being missing and one of the things that that we even responded to a tiktok video earlier this week on point of view where a where the argument was made that saying that children should be protected by their fathers or by the men in their lives that the men should be protectors um is um degrading and uh, is acting as if little girls and, and women uh, can't protect themselves. And, and it's, it's this whole idea that, that men need to step aside and not really fulfill their, their purpose, you know, being a protector, being that influence in the home. What do you think is the result in homes when fathers are missing? Well, I've, I, there have been numerous studies that, that will hit from every different direction, from incarceration numbers to addiction numbers, to crime numbers, to abuse, relational abuse. Uh, and I am 
I'm a guy, I'm a divorced and remarried guy. I mean, I met the Lord uh, as a result of my marriage kind of just imploding. Uh, and it was probably mostly my fault that it did. It's always two people in any dance, but I will own my 100% of my 50% of that marriage and it fell apart. And for a season, uh, my kids didn't live with me. And because my ex-wife, the mother of my kids, also grew up in a home with uh, an absentee father uh, because her mom said, you know, you don't really need your dad. And then it becomes generational and it begins to go downhill from there. And so my kids were raised for a short period of time in a home with no father figure whatsoever uh, through a series of circumstances. And she, she passed away in 2009 of cancer and my kids ended up back under my roof um, then I was able to resume my, my position as father. But honestly, in that season where I wasn't involved, uh, all kinds of things went off the rails. My son dealt with addiction and he got connected to the wrong crowd. And the Bible says bad company corrupts good character. And so because he had a, a single mom who was working and I, I was so cut out of the picture, in fact, that when she did pass away and I had to move my son from Seattle back to Florida, I called his school to get his records transferred to his new school here in Florida. And they had no record that I even existed. And in order to prove that he was my son, I had to send a copy of the birth certificate to the school to prove that I was on the father line and that he was indeed biologically my kid. And I'm, I thought I was doing things pretty well. And in point of fact, this is a, a a situation that occurs often where dad has been kind of removed from the equation. And I get emails from guys often that are um, being cut out of the process, being eliminated from visitation and all the things that really need to be a part of it. Every kid needs two parents. It just, it is what it is. You don't have to like what I'm saying, but it, it's the truth because the Bible says when, when we get married, that two become one and, and our kids need the covering and the uh, leadership of a dad and the loving arms of a father just as much as they need their mom. It's just, it, just, it is what it is. It's the biblical model. And that's where, again, we have gone culturally kind of in our own direction. And that never ends well. We look back biblically in any empire that's done that, whether it's Rome or 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 Babylon, uh, they, it doesn't end well when when the culture deviates from what yeah. the Word of God says. You, and I mean, you, I you, don't shoot the messenger. I mean, I'm just telling you <laughs> what. Well, you what, and I, believe good... me. I lived I lived my life unsaved for the first 35 years of it. I didn't know anything about God. God wasn't invited to my first wedding. He wasn't invited to my divorce. He was not spoken of in my home as I was brought up by a great couple of parents, my mom and dad, God love them, are still together 56 years later with no God, sheer force of will. Uh, and I needed my dad just as much as I needed my mom. And I still do. He's 85. She's 80. And uh, they both bring different things to the table that I need in my life. Uh, two very different skill sets yeah. that are equally important. Well, you bring up a good point because, you know, obviously the goal is husband and wife married raising the kids together, right? This is obviously the goal, but we live sure. in a messy world and a messy society. And sometimes that doesn't work out. And, and you know, it's not even always a result of sin. Sometimes it's one of the parties dies, one of the parents dies. What do you say to fathers who wish they had made different decisions or wish they were? What can they do even if they have made mistakes in this area? You've been through this. What would you, what would be your advice to someone like that? Well, everything everything revolves around pride, brother. I mean, it just it is what it is. And in order to set things right, you may be listening or watching, and you may be living under the same roof uh, with your wife right now on the ragged edge of divorce. You may uh, be that guy who I was for a while. I was a an absentee father, but I was actually physically in the building. I was just completely emotionally, spiritually, and for the most part, physically disengaged from what was going on with my kids. But if you're watching uh, and you know, you and I are right now are currently both alive. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. We're both breathing. And 
God's mercies are new every morning. And there is a way in full humility, the antithesis of pride is to just, you know, sometimes you got to sit a big plate of crow in front of you and eat it. And you go to your wife and say, look, I, you know, I, I've said some things that I am really and truly sorry for. How can I make this right? Um, I would encourage any man to sit down in front of their children, regardless of age. I mean, obviously, one and three would be too young. But my, you know, my daughter just uh, yesterday turned 29. Uh, I have two of my own kids that are 27 and 29, three stepkids that I got in the bonus round that are 23, 26, and 27. So we've got all these 20-somethings running around. And sit down, look them right in the face, and say, is there something that I've ever said to you that hurt you? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and expect to get the responses that you don't want to hear. But part of manhood is owning when you've been wrong, admitting it, and fixing it. And I think that a lot of the problems that we face today, if we would shelve our pride and say, you know what? My wife needs to th see things my way and, and step back and say, wait a minute, maybe I'm the one that's, you know, I, we're all 100% responsible for our 50% of every relationship we're involved in. A lot of the wounding that our kids are dealing with, I've discovered my kids, a lot of the wounding came from my mouth. You know, the yeah. Bible says that the tongue has the power to bring life and bring death. And I have spoken death over my kids. I've said stupid things that I wish I could unsay. And I promise you there are guys right now that are watching. There are women right now that are watching that are like, you know, I really wish my husband would just come to me and say, or my wife would come to me and say, look, I was wrong. And I don't know why it's so difficult uh, for us to do that. But if you want to push the holy reset button on your relationship with your wife or your husband or your kids, we have to sit down and say, I, I think I'm the one that might be partly responsible for this. I had a relationship fracture with my father where I didn't speak to him for a lot of years. I was so mad at my dad because he did this and he did that. And when I sat and spoke to my mom one day as she was telling me some of the things that I had done, I realized that through some real strong conviction that I was 99% at fault for the condition of the relationship with my father. Mm -hmm. And I got on a plane and flew all the way to Portland, Oregon, where my dad lives and showed up at their house unannounced just to look my dad in the face and say, I'm sorry. And it didn't wow. go the way that I wanted it to go. One of the things about forgiveness is God's forgiveness of us is immediate, but people not so much. And my dad was not quick to forgive. In fact, he remembered all the nasty things I had said to him and said, you know what? After everything I did for you, you called me these terrible names. And I don't think I can ever forgive that. And I just kept teeing it back up and saying, look, dad, I, I, I may look like the same guy, but I'm not. And if you just watch me long enough, you'll see that I'm a, a new creation. I'm a different mm -hmm. person. And it took, uh, that was in 2012, and it's taken nine years. And I think my dad and I are finally right back to where we were when I was a little kid, and we had a great relationship. Wow. But it's taken a lot of work and a lot of humility. And that's really what it all revolves around. If you want a solid marriage, if you want to be a solid dad, you have to sit down and, and ask the tough questions because you're going to hear some hard things that are probably going to confront you with your own failures yeah, and, and then begin to work through that and make it right. So what you're saying is that, that the men in, in this country and the men who are under the sound of this, of this uh, recording, wherever they are listening to this, just need to do the hard work and be men and go out there and fight for their families, fight for not physically fight, just emotionally do yeah. the work of going after, you know, whatever it needs to be done to try to make things well, right. And to yeah, man, and a lot of the hard work has to be done in here, you know, yeah. right there in the heart. And, and I'm telling you, I have heard things from my kids. I had my son call me the worst dad ever at one point. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that little snot nosed punk. And then I realized that he was right. And yeah. when you begin to look at things with utter humility, that's truly what manhood is, is shelving your pride, and saying, I am going to submit um, to what these people are saying to me. I'm going to allow them to speak into my life. And if God shows me that there's some things that I need to fix, then I, it, that's between me and God. And I'm going to do it. I am yeah. going to shelve my pride and in all humility, allow him to do a work in me 
And hopefully it's not too late relationally. And God hates divorce. He says so in his word. Yeah. And if we make the effort, he will, he will come right back in and, and join us as a teammate in, we can't change a heart, man. Only God can do that. But if we go to our wives or our kids in the humility of saying, look, I screwed up. And when I said that I was angry and it had nothing to do with you. And I just hope you can forgive me. And they may not, but that's what being a man is, is owning it. Yeah. Now you've actually put out some really great resources for men yeah. who do want to, you know, Hey, I want to step up. I want to be the man that I ought to be. Um, one of these, I think, is a new book called The, the Battle, right? Tactics yeah. for Biblical Manhood. Tell, tell, the, uh, tell our listeners, our watchers, um, what, what that book is about and how that can, can help them. Well, let me put it this way. First, you need to know I'm a movie freak. I love movies. I, I'm the guy who will channel surf until I find a few good men, and then I'll watch it for the 427th time with commercials, <laughs> even though I own it on DVD. I love movies. Uh, everything that I've done, my first book called Rough Cut Men went number one in men's Christian living on Amazon back in 2017. And my live event incorporates movie clips. And so uh, the new book is also centered around a movie. If anyone has seen the movie, We Were Soldiers, which stars Mel Gibson and Barry Pepper and Sam Elliott. It's about a, a unit, the 1st Cavalry, uh, the 1st Battalion U.S. Cavalry Air Mobile, who were the first first soldiers to really hit the ground in 1965 in Vietnam that was regular soldier on regular soldier up until that point we were using consultants and CIA guys to try and train the locals how to fight the North Vietnamese but President Johnson sent in the first cavalry division and these guys were uh, were one of them they used helicopters for the first time in combat which was a whole new tactic they were using new weaponry 395 of them hit the ground in 1965 uh, and they found themselves landing on top of an entire division of enemy, which was about 2,000 uh, enemy soldiers. And they won through a combination of great close air support and artillery and really amazing movements on the on the battlefield. They defeated, uh, outnumbered five to one, this enemy for a short period of time. Obviously, the war lasted 10 years, and this was the first real battle. And uh, Randall Wallace, who, who directed Braveheart, decided to turn it into a movie called We Were Soldiers. And through a series of just weird God things, I ended up connected to this group of soldiers, not the wow. actors. I was actually connected to the group of soldiers. So every wow. year, my wife and I go to uh, the Landing Zone X-Ray Reunion. That was the name of the landing zone where these guys landed in uh, the Central Highlands of Southern Vietnam in 1965. And so I've had a chance to interview all the guys that were there that survived, you know, of the 395 that landed within the first 24 hours of the conflict, 121 were wounded and 79 were killed. So they lost two thirds of the fighting force very quickly in that battle. But uh, the, the guys that are still left, I know, um, and their families and their grandkids. And as I was interviewing them for this book, uh, really didn't know which direction it was gonna go. I discovered that everything these guys did on the battlefield to win outnumbered five to one, they also did as leaders at home. They loved their troopers uh, just as much as they loved their families. They led without, with resolve. They never once shook. They, they, they didn't let an enemy that the Bible says in our respects is out in John 10, 10 says he wants to steal, kill and destroy. The enemy of our souls has figured out that if you can take a man out of a family, you can ruin the marriage, you can ruin the kids and you can ruin the generational legacy that comes after that man with one shot one shot, multiple kill. So this book actually has tactics learned on the battlefield in Vietnam and applies them to biblical manhood. Again, not wow. to confuse that with masculinity, but biblical manhood, what it means to submit to leadership, what it means to be surrounded uh, by a, a man to your right and a man to your left, because anybody that was successful in the Bible, any man that was successful, whether it was David or Moses, David had Jonathan right next to him all the time. Moses had Aaron and her holding his arms up uh, when he could no longer hold his staff above his head. He had people around him. So the need for other men in our lives to hold us accountable, to encourage us, to support us. I have a buddy in my life named David that will tell me the hard truth. You know, I'll come into a, a meeting and sit down over lunch and say, man, my wife is furious right now. And his response is always, 
well, what did you do? Because he knows that my wife is a responder and she will follow my lead, whatever that lead might be. So if I'm a jerk, she's going to fire back. And we work through things and he will hold me accountable to make sure that I'm tithing, to make sure that I have a date night calculated into my calendar, that I'm not too busy uh, to spend time with the kids, that I have time for my family mixed into my speaking schedule. I travel 120 days a year. I'm on I'm in the air a quarter million miles a year and I speak in wow. Australia, New Zealand and all over the United States. And it's very easy to become very busy doing great things. But if I don't take care of this ministry that I have at home, uh, the statement goes, if you lose your headquarters tent on the battlefield, uh, which is where everything is, your leadership, your medical, your, your communications devices, uh, your leadership, if you lose that headquarters, you've lost everything. And I often tell men, if your ministry at home is no good, your ministry to other people is going to be no good also. Wow. Uh, so it really shifts the focus to making sure that our home is locked down, that our marriage is right, that we're spending time with our kids, that we're loving everybody under our roof. Um, and then it radiates out from there. And the only way we can love is if we wake up in the morning and sit down on the couch before everybody else is awake and, and spend some quiet time with the Lord saying, all right, you know, show me what I need to do today. Speak to me through your word. You know, whisper to me in that still small voice. And once we have our marching orders, then we can truly lead well, just like a good soldier. Wow. And so that's, that is so that's good. what the book, the book has interviews. It has movie clips in it from, from we were soldiers. It's kind of a hybrid of, uh, biblical truth, battle tactics learned uh, on the field in Vietnam, and some movie dialogue and some interviews and some really crazy stuff wow. uh, from interviews that you won't see in the movie or you won't read in the original book, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, that was written by Hal Moore, who was the commander on the battlefield, and Joe Galloway, who was a UPI reporter that was right there. So it's a, it's a really unique hybrid. It also has a 21-day devotional at the end of it, um, because I want I want to practice what I preach and my quiet time regimen is hit and miss. And so I give guys, uh, they say 21 days forms a habit. So I give guys a 21 day devotional and they're fun. Uh, they're not hyper spiritual or uh, I am not the guy that will, that will talk to you about the exegesis of Paul's epistles in the original Greek language. Cause yeah. that ain't going to help me be a better husband. Right. <laughs> so well, you that's, know, I, I, I hate is. to, uh, I hate to cut, we're just running out of time here and this oh, has yeah. been such a, such good content. I appreciate it so much. I don't want to edit any of it. So we're going to keep all of it in there. I just have to cut you <laughs> off now, uh, in order no, to keep it, good. but, um, thank you so much. I am, I'm so excited about this. I'm sure everybody who's watching wants to run out right now and get the book. Where can they find a tact the battle tactics for biblical manhood? It is honestly in digital, it's in audio, and it's in paperback form anywhere you buy books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, if you want signed copies, or if you want to know any more about me or the live event or a video series that we created for men's ministry, uh, my website is www.roughcutmen.org, roughcutmen.org. You can also get signed copies of the book there, and you'll learn everything you need to know about who I am and what I do as a ministry. David Dusek, thank you so much for joining us on Point of View today. Oh, thanks for having me. God bless you.